All right, we're going to start with the second half of or the second morning session of our um, experiments day. And I'm very pleased to introduce now Professor Ray Dutch, who is the director of the Center for Experimental Social Sciences at Nuffield College. Um, as Zonka was mentioning in his morning talk, CES is quite an extraordinary achievement in that it has a, its own subject pool of 50,000 50, um, subjects spread across four locations in well, Nuffield in the UK, but then also in Chile, in India, and in China. So it's quite, uh, it's quite an undertaking and has really allowed uh, experimentation or experimental social sciences to be advanced. Uh, and Ray is going to talk a bit about some of his work, but also I imagine uh, work that's being done at CES. Um, Ray himself is a political scientist who's done excellent work using uh, experiments, digital trace data, and um, public opinion analysis. And I mean, he's written a lot of very impressive papers. Um, so I think he's going to talk a lot about them. So I'm going to let him do the talking rather than myself. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Is it on? Yeah. Cool. Great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, from what I've heard, this has been a really uh, interesting and rewarding uh, week. Uh, and next week should be, I suspect, also really a, a, a cool um, educational experience. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, my work and CES. Most of the stuff I'll talk about is work that has been conducted at CES. Um, I'm going to introduce, oops, oh, now I'm. So, yeah, you just, so you, like, it's like a touch screen. <laughs> I can do, screw it up. Okay. But here we can use this stuff. So you want to just use like normal. Cool. Um, so there are three parts to the talk. Uh, one of them will be a brief introduction to CES, which I think uh, Sanke has already really uh, filled you in on, so uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, I'll introduce the talk. Uh, the talk has two modules. One uh, will look at uh, micro-replications, uh, a, a work that uh, I've been doing uh, exploring experimental measurement error. And the second module will talk about designing virtual experiments with post-stratified average treatment effects. Um, so without any ado, uh, the introduction. So I think Sess went over uh, basically who we are. Uh, we have four centers here in Oxford, Santiago, Chile, India, and China. We have a pretty extensive online facility, which Sanke manages. Um, and we have, as he pointed out, the subject pool about 50,000 people. It's actually spread over the UK, Ireland, India, China, the US, and Chile. Um, and uh, we're also, as you'll see in the second module, we're also involved in field experiments. Um, uh, in addition to all of this, we do workshops, we have summer schools, and we do visiting post and pre-doc uh, 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 arrangements. The talk. So the talk will be, I think, will be experimental perspectives on themes you covered this week. I sort of guessed here, so, but I, uh, from my casual conversations, I think it's true. Uh, basically, it'll sort of be a, a mix of computational methods, large data, social media, and what I consider really important, this notion of robust replications. Um, the second module, uh, um, the first module that I'll talk about will be about how to detect experimental measurement error. Um, I'll talk about how experimental context or mode is really important for uh, detecting experimental measurement error. And I'll explain how you how we use machine learning uh, as a as a key element of that exercise. Um, and then the last module we'll talk about uh, large scale experimental interventions. This is uh, a project that's ongoing that just that's just started. Uh, it focuses on digital digital trace broadly defined outcomes. 
and uh, it employs post ratification in order to sort of estimate average treatment effects. So that's the that's the layout of what I'll be discussing. And interrupt if I'm totally obtuse at any point, <laughs> or if you have any questions. Um, microreplication. So I've been focusing on this pretty extensively because um, I think that uh, we've sort of moved into this sort of what I call data generation, which is one in which uh, the costs of generating data have declined dramatically. Um, access to data has uh, been what I would call democratized. So lots of people have access to, the, to, to, to data. Um, uh, convenience samples have become the norm. Nobody assigns Leslie Kish anymore and talks about representative samples. <laughs> um, and there's been a, a, just a proliferation of data, what I would call data generation modes out there. And all of this has implications for the kinds of research we're doing, the kinds of research that gets reported and um, uh, has, in my view, uh, resulted in some sort of probably negative uh, side effects or, 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 uh, or outcomes. And the most important one is that lots of stuff that gets published can't be replicated, right? I mean, and this is a, this is, this is, this is a table, uh, a figure from Collins' 19, 2018 Nature piece where he replicated a number of uh, experiments that were published in highly regarded psychology journals. And the, uh, the yellow stuff is the stuff that couldn't get replicated, right? And these are, these, are, these, are, these are studies that are published in some of the leading psychology journals in the discipline, and replication's a serious problem. But you could see this in economics, you can see this in political science. I, I don't know sociology, actually, because, uh, but I, I suspect you have a similar problem in sociology. So replication's an issue. And, uh, and I think part of the reason it's an, uh, it's an issue is because, oops, oops, now I've gotten, I want to go back. There's a smaller button. The oh, it's the smaller one. OK. <laughs> Great. So the reason we have this problem, I think, is because of this democratization of data generation, the fact that the costs of data generation have been dramatically reduced, uh, the fact that the people, people generate data using all kinds of uh, uh, data generation modes, right? Um, and uh, the problem, of course, at least in the experimental world, is if you do an experiment, right, um, how do you know you're in either the blue or the orange state, right? You do an experiment, you get a result, <laughs> you write up a paper, you submit it to the American Economics Review, and uh, the question, the important question here for me in any case is that, how do you know this is not generated by experimental, oops, experimental measurement error? Oops, I'm gonna, right? Um, the, uh, typically you don't have a clue is my point, right? I mean, so you don't really know that this is, this, you know, you, 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 you've done an experiment with 500 people, right? You've got this result. It's a significant treat, average treatment effect. You really have, it's very uncertain as to whether this result is um, robust, right? Now you can, repub you can publish it and uh, you, know, you may end up being one of the unfortunate people in the yellow side, right? People try to replicate your result and it can't, doesn't replicate, right? Um, and so I've been thinking about sort of how do you address this issue? How do you, how do you basically take measures to ensure that the experiment that you've conducted, right, is, a is generating a robust result, right? Um, well, microreplications may be a way to address this, right? Microreplications being replications within the same uh, study, right? Essentially, I do a study and, oh, maybe I better microreplicate this to make sure it's a robust result, to make sure that other people will be able to re replicate it if it gets published, right? Um, 
uh, and the point or the argument I, I, I make in this, in, this, in this article basically is that multi rather, th rather than single mode replications are the way to approach the problem, right? So for example, if you do a, an MTurk study <laughs> and you get a interesting result, uh, don't simply sort of uh, you know, pay 500 more MTurk respondents to do the exact same experiment, right? And then argue that you've got a robust micro replication. Right? So rather than, rather than replicate within a mono or single repl uh, mode, think about replicating in multi-modes. Right? Um, that's the sort of punchline of this entire, uh, of this, this, this particular module. Um, and I'll, there are lots of different modes or contexts in which you can conduct this work. Right? You can use Amazon, you can use Lucid. These are basically crowdsourced, or you could use Respondi, which is a large-scale uh, 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 subject pool, uh, uh, commercial subject pool. You could use something like Knowledge Networks in the US, which has a very sort of representative sample of online respondents. Or you could use us, or you could do something like the American National Election Study, or GSS, right, which has a very robust uh, representative in-person sample, right? So the, the, the point is that there's various kinds of modes that you can use when you're thinking about um, uh, uh, replicating a particular uh, experiment. Um, and what are you trying to do? Well, you're trying to sort of figure out whether there is measurement error associated with a particular mode, right? So ME sub K is basically the measurement error associated with a particular mode, right? And when you represent an average treatment effect, you should always assume that it's going to uh, re reflect real, a real average treatment effect plus the measurement error, right? And the point is, uh, how do you sort of figure out how big this MEK is? Well, if you only if you only do this in one mode, you don't have an you don't have really any idea, right? If you only do this with MTurk, right, you're not going to really be able to figure out whether uh, there is mode related experimental error, right? So unless you look at different modes, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to sort of figure that out. Um, and uh, if you if, if, if you're reasonably comfortable that you can identify the measurement error, right, then uh, uh, replicating in multi-modes is a dominant strategy. Right? That's, that's, uh, that's what I'm going to try to convince you, convince you with, with this particular uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> so this is a simulation that we did as part of this paper. This is a paper that is, uh, is coming out in political analysis. And what the simulation basically suggests is that these, this, these mu's here basically indicate how certain uh, a researcher is that they will be able to identify which of the modes is actually um, the better mode, or the mode with the low or ideally close to zero measurement error, right? Now, if you don't think you can figure this out, then replicating in multi-modes is not going to help you, right? And so what we, what, what we, what we try, try to illustrate in the simulation is that, okay, well, uh, what happens if you uh, ha are 50% are likely to sort of identify which of the modes is the low error or zero measurement error mode, right? And of course, as this row gets higher, right, um, you're much more likely to be able to identify which of the modes is low error versus high error, okay? So um, what this horizontal axis suggests is the probability that you are, um, uh, you are actually right, in a high measurement error um, uh, context. Right? And what the uh, vertical axis suggests is the probability that you are in a very low zero measurement error context. Right? And what the simulation is suggesting is that as long as you have a reasonably good chance of identifying which of the modes has low measurement error, right, um, then um, uh, the green is basically a reduction in the, um, uh, the reduction in the sampling error relative to the, the, the um, basically the, the green indicates that 
uh, you're more likely to select the right mode uh, if you replicate in a second mode, and right? And basically what this is suggesting is that as long as you're reasonably, reasonably adept at identifying the, the mode that has low measurement error, then uh, replicating in a different mode is always the optimal strategy, right? Um, okay, so let me just illustrate this. So this is a, 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 an experiment that um, I've been doing with two other, uh, two, uh, with an economist in Russia and uh, one of our postdocs in, in, in Santiago. And the experiment is just a lying experiment, right? Uh, and it's uh, sim similar to a public goods game. Uh, people play this experiment. Uh, and people, people conduct or are asked to do a real effort task, which involves adding some digits. And then they're asked to report their income. Um, and they can lie about the income. And uh, our, interest, our interest really is how much lying occurs in these experiments, right? And the treatment in this experiment is a deduction rate, right? So uh, the deduction rates uh, vary. And the expectation is that the lying will decline as the deduction rates increase. So it's a, it's a pretty simple experiment. I'll show you. I'll give you the details of the, the actual design, right? So uh, people come into this experiment, and there are three different tax rates, either 10%, 20%, or 30% tax rates or deduction rates. Uh, people play this, this experiment in groups of four. Uh, and the, once the taxes are levied, they're redistributed equally amongst the group members. So there's a public good. There's no excludability. There's no social gains or losses. <laughs> Um, in most of these, there's no audits or fines, and people play this 10 times. And they're paid for one of the rounds at random. They play in groups of four, and there's random matching at the beginning of these experiments. Okay. So the, in each round, people add these two-digit numbers. They have one minute. Um, the more numbers they add, the more money they make. Um, and they're then told how much money they've made. Uh, and then they're told, uh, then they have to declare their income. And then they're uh, told what their total profit is. And their total profit equals how much they didn't declare, plus the, 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 the equally shared tax revenues in their group of four. So the, the, the experiment is pretty simple, right? Um, and our primary interest here is understanding uh, the extent to which uh, people lie about their income uh, at uh, the, uh, after they conduct this real effort task. And then the treatments in this experiment are varying the deduction rates. Um, OK, so that's a, it's a sort of simple public, good, public goodsy kind of game. Um, so the interesting part here is that we conduct this experiment in different modes. So this is my mode, this is the modes element here. So I conduct this experiment, we conducted this experiment initially in the CES Oxford lab, right? Um, we did this with the CES Oxford subject pool. We had in total 16,000 decisions, right? Made by 116 subjects. And uh, about the average rate of lying for those subjects was about 57%. So, so subjects basically uh, uh, lied or, or, or declared 40, 43% of their income, and, 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 and the lying rate was 57%, right? So that's the, the outcome of the, of the Oxford lab. So that's... Well, just in person. They come... Oh, yes. So, yes. So this is a lab experiment, right? They come in person. They come to our lab, which is just next door, basically. And uh, they play this game. So usually about 25 people come into the lab and play it. 24 come into the lab and play it. They're divided into groups of four. And then they, they play this. Actually, they paid in the lab. They, they actually played it a little bit more than 10, 10, 10 rounds. But, but that's the, and this was the sort of foundational result. So we get this result. And we thought, OK, well, there's a fair amount of lying. Um, and, uh, but this is one mode, 
right? And so we, we, we actually replicated this in a, a number of different modes. So we also replicated, um, we did it with our online subject pool, right? And so here we had about um, 1,367 decisions and we had 144 subjects play. Now this, people played online. So they, they, they came into a virtual waiting room, they waited till there were four people, they then, they then played the game exactly as we played it in the lab, except they played it online, right? Um, and so that's a different mode, right? So people are playing this now, and it's a different subject pool. It, it's a different subject pool. It's our virtual subject pool. Uh, we then had people come. We then conducted the exact same, uh, 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 let me just, now I'm going to confuse this. Um, so actually this, this version is our subjects from the lab playing the experiment online. This version of the experiment is our virtual subject pool actually playing it online. And the last, uh, uh, the last uh, column here are US MTurk subjects playing the experiment online. So the idea here is we, we, we very significantly uh, changed the, the actual mode in which the, which the experiment was being conducted. And so this, is, this gives you a flavor of what I'm suggesting people ought to do when they're, when they're conducting these experiments, if they want to leverage mode right, as a possible explanation for uh, measurement error. So, um, so one thing I'm concerned about is whether demographics are sort of like controlled here across all different modes. That's, that's a very good question. So I'm not concerned about, I'm not so much concerned about demographics, but it is obviously an issue. <laughs> and I'll show you in the analysis how we deal with it. Uh, because obviously you're right, these people will all be young, right? <laughs> As will these people, right? But as we get into the online subject pool, we're going to get older subjects, right? Uh, particularly in the in the in the in the, the MTurk world, where we'll get a, 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 a more representative uh, 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 sample of the population. Um, I'm going to focus on trying to tease out the the mode effect here. Um, yes. Just a quick question, because the experiment, you needed groups of four, right? How does that work with the uh, MTurks? Do they also have like a an, an virtual waiting room and that yes. stuff? Does it, does it work the same? Oh, yes. Cool. I didn't know it, it's not easy. Let me put, let me, let me, let me, let, let, this is very difficult to do online, actually, because what has to happen is that the virtual <laughs> subjects have to come into a virtual waiting room. They have to wait till there's four individuals, and then they basically um, uh, play the game, right? So it's... It's quite challenging, right? Um, uh, and uh, I'm only reporting here the, the results uh, from the UK and the MTurk, but we also did this in other countries, right? Um, okay. So this is the conventional sort of estimation, right? Where basically I've simply broken up the groups into uh, the results into these, the lab, the online lab, the online UK, and the MTurk, right? And the initial sort of uh, 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 suggestion here is that, uh, oops, I shouldn't touch the screen, okay. The, the deduction rate here clearly seems to be working, right? As the deduction rate goes up, right, um, you're actually, people are reporting less of their income, right? That's the negative coefficient. Um, there's some evidence here that the online subject pool, right, is behaving differently. So this is the conventional strategy, right? So what we argue in this paper is that really you want to sort of leverage um, uh, machine learning to try to tease out the heterogeneity, right? Because uh, essentially what we argue in the paper is that you want to be totally... Um, um, uh, indifferent about what the possible heter heterogeneous treatment effects can be, right? And then you want to look at all of the possible heterogeneous treatment effects 
and then draw some conclusion as to whether it's mode related or whether it's, as you pointed out, maybe related to particular demographical uh, characteristics, right? Um, so that's the, uh, that's the, the, the punchline of this paper, right? And so we argue basically that you want to use some sort of um, a machine learning effort to sort of identify conditional average treatment effects, right? In other words, the average treatment effects that are conditioned on particular characteristics either of the mode or of the sample, right? And uh, so that's the first sort of stage of this uh, 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 estimation strategy. So we use this BART estimation, uh, which is sort of like a random forest, which I'm assuming that Roberto talked about. Okay. Um, and uh, so basically, it's just sort of a machine learning strategy for teasing out uh, heterogeneity in the data set, right? Um, and what this essentially allows us to do for each individual in the data set. So if you go back here, um, we have a lot of decisions, right? We have about 24,000 decisions here, 600, 700 here. Now they're not totally independent. 14,000 here and 15,000 here. So we have lots of decisions being made, right? And, and that's really important, right? Um, and the, uh, the, the idea here is we want to be able to determine whether the average treatment effect with respect to any particular covariate in the data set, right? Um, uh, varies, right? So that's the big, so in an, in an ideal world, right, the average treatment effect, right, should be constant across for all individuals in this data set, right? So the BART estimation is going to allow us to look at the extent to which the average treatment effect is different for different individuals in the data set. Um, and also will allow us to infer whether variation in conditional average treatment effect is related to mode or something else. So that's the, the punchline of this exercise. Uh, so the, the BART R code is available on my GitHub, uh, it, and it's pretty simple to implement, right? Um, and this is the result, right? So this is the result. So what does the result tell us? So if you look at this blue line, that's the estimated average treatment effect for all of the data, right? Um, and basically, uh, it's about, it's clearly, it's, it's, it's about a negative point, point oh 0.07, right? Which is the right direction, right? So we want, we want, the, we want the treatment effect to be negative because we, as deduction rates go up, we want people to cheat more, right? Or, and, and report less. So that's clearly uh, uh, the right outcome. The dotted red line is the zero effect, right? Um, and all we've done, and this is the sort of attraction of the sort of uh, the BART estimation strategy, is we've simply uh, basically organized all of the conditional average treatment effects along this horizontal, horizontal axis, and then we've looked at uh, the Okay, and then we've looked at uh, you know the uh, the magnitudes, right? So clearly, uh, if you sort of look, so this is what's sort of really attraction attractive about this estimation strategy, right? It's visually very summary, right? It gives you a very nice summar summarization of the, all of the data very quickly. So so this basically suggests that well, most of the conditional average treatment effects are below zero, which is good, right? Um, there are some above zero, but they're not that many, right? Uh, so that's sort of encouraging. And then all we've done here is we've presented, a, we've, we've simply uh, graphically presented the data uh, and color coded the four different um, uh, modes. Because modes, the modes are what we really were, what we were really interested in this, in this paper. And, uh, oh, now I don't have the legend, but I, I, I think I remember. Um, so the, the, the red is the lab, the conventional lab mode. The orange or brown is the, um, the lab participants online. And the 
uh, gray is mTurk, and this light color is um, is the CES online subject pool for the UK. Right. So 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 right off the bat, you get a sense right from a, a, a visual sense of whether mode matters here. Right. Right. You get a visual sense of whether mode is affecting the uh, magnitude of the average treatment effect, right? And clearly, it, there is clearly some evidence here, right? Clearly, the, uh, and this was your intuition, right? I mean, clearly, the online subject pool clearly is, uh, is more likely to have a um, uh, quite moderated treatment effect, right? The lab uh, subjects clearly are much more likely to behave, behave rationally, um, which is consistent with a variety of other stuff that I've done. So it's, it's, not, it's not surprising. Now, so this is, the, this is what I argue people should do. They should do their experiments in different modes. They should explicitly tr use diverse modes, right? Because you, you want to establish the robustness of your treatment effect, right? And then, and then visually explore the likelihood that mode might be might be affecting the magnitude of your treatment effects right yes so just a cl clarification so this is a conditional average treatment effect conditioned specifically only on the mode or this is conditioned like on the i saw that you included gender and age so this you is can do everything you can do all, here i've just presented the mode so the, the one above is also... So, so, so here's the way to think about this. So this is all of the individuals in the data set, right? So this person here, right, might be a woman uh, age 19, 19 um, uh, in the, the UK subject pool lab. That's the way to think about it. And actually, these are decisions. So that person actually shows up 10 times, right? Um, but the, her decision could vary, actually. Um, so, uh, and I've just taken that da this data here and just reorganized it, right? So I'm only looking at the four modes, right? But you could reorganize it however you want, right? You could then say, I'm going to look at gender, I'm going to look at gender and whatever you want. So I've just... It's just the average, so the average treatment effect for each person? Each person. And then you, you show I just, the mode. Exactly, right, that's it. So that's the sort of attraction of these, uh, like the BART method explicitly estimates a, uh, an average treatment effect for each, covari each unique covariate in the data set, right? And then you can sort of organize everything however you want, right? That's the, and so this is what I, this is my argument is that this is probably how you want to sort of approach the, the exercise. Um, yep. Uh, just a short question. I mean, like, on the x-axis, x -axis, it, mu it must be, like, decisions. Like, if you have 5,000... It's there, decisions. It's decisions. It, how, how can you compute, like, an, a treatment effect for a decision? I mean, it's... Well, it's because... Oh, that's a good point. Well, the, the person, this individual, will make 10 decisions, right? Um, and so here, we've, commu we've actually computed a average treatment effect for that person 10 times. But then it must be like, like there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot the of core yes there's a, there's a high amount of correlation here yes. Now but it's not total right? I mean because people will make you know for example you might argue that in 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 the in the uh, in in the uh, as a covariate you might think when you make that decision matters. So whether you make it in round one whether, or whether you make it in round 10. So that can be part of the covariate um, dimensionality, right? But you're right. I mean, they're probably highly correlated. It's a bit misleading to sort of say I've got 5,000 uh, 5, observations here. I, I, I can see that. <clears throat> It's probably more like 500. <laughs> um, okay, so but this is sort of generally the flavor of the what the way I think you should approach the 
the, the problem of, of micro-replication in multi-modes, uh, uh, find out whether you know, there is some uh, heterogeneity to the conditional average treatment effects, and then think about whether it's related to mode. And that's what we did. And then we asked ourselves the question, well, why are we getting... So then the, the hard part, of course, then is, well, why are we getting this, right? So that's the next stage of the analysis, right? Clearly, there seems to be some measurement error here, but why, right? Yes? Um, because also you choose different countries, right? And different modes are only specific in different countries. Wouldn't it be better to test all the modes on one country, maybe? Did that's you a good point. About that? <laughs> that's a good point. So we, so we effectively did... The, the first three modes are all in the U, uh, UK, but we then did want, we did want to use a crowd, a, a, a sort of a crowdsourced um, mode like MTurk. And the, the, the problem is, at least when we started doing this, it was very difficult to find a crowdsourced mode in the UK. So we did take the easy solution and we did do it in the US. But, the, 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 but, but you may be right, but the, the point is that the, the UK, uh, or the, the, the MTurkers and the UK online subject pool, right, do sort of exhibit similar patterns. But you're right, in an optimal world, we should not have, we should not have uh, gone out of the UK. I agree. Uh, yeah, I had a question about, because um, the modes are still within, like, uh, uh, into sample selection, right? Right? after people kind of go to the Nuffield or the, uh, you're in Chile or through the Mechanical Turk. So the virtue is to weed out measurement error relative to some sort of general population of people who are in all the different surveys. Yes. So we try to do that. I'll show you in a minute how we do. I, or maybe, I mean, we, we, we try to address this. And I'll, I'll, you can see whether you think we did it reasonably. Right. Because the idea then being that replication is so that the initial study, which is basically the, the reason for, for this uh, uh, in-depth analysis, uh, is that replication hasn't been successful. But then this would not solve if replication is done in the same mode, right? If there is still a, a non, null value in replication within Mechanical Turk, there will be a logical comparison, right? Yes, yes, okay. yes. exactly. The, so, so if you did the Mechanical Turk study, the, I would argue that the value added of doing a, a replication within a Mechanical Turk is probably not a high, yeah. right? And that's what our, that, the little simulation showed. It's probably better to think about doing the replication in a very different context in a very different mode, uh, because that will be more informative. Yeah. But, but then, uh, just to, to, to get it clear, because uh, would you then suggest that nature replicates in a different mode? You, you surely they should do it in the same mode, right? Because if they do it in the mode with the highest measurement error, then the, the, the risk, of, well, the risk or the probability of having a different result than the original paper just goes up by virtue of measurement error. Well, or you, or you could sort of think about the fact that you replicate in a much more noisy environment as being a conservative yeah. replication okay. test, right? right? I, see. I mean, that's, that's what I would argue. I mean, I would definitely argue that. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was also wondering um, the within mode variation and how you compare that, because I guess the lab has a bigger variation compared to like the MTurk. So in other words, is, is the variation uh, within the... Uh, uh, lab mode, right, much higher than the variation within the, uh, uh, or, or, or much higher than the variation across modes, right? Yes, you could, you could easily look, you could easily do that with these data, right? You know, easily, right? Uh, uh, you could do a basically sort of, you could, you could compare the sort of variation across modes easily, right? Um, I didn't do that, although I'll show you something in a minute that I think sort of goes in that direction. Okay, so let me, no, that's not the direction. No, maybe it is. Okay, so it is. So the thing is, you, 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 you see this, you see this, these differences across modes. Then the question is, well, is there some, can you establish 
what it is about the modes that might be contributing to this measurement error. And so that was the next stage. That, that was the next step in this exercise that we went through, right? We then sort of said, well, maybe there's something wrong with mTurk, right? Maybe there's something about mTurk experiments that creates measurement error, right? So that was the next stage. Okay, so all we did here was say, okay, people made these decisions 10 times. One possibility is the mTurk people aren't paying attention, right? That they're just clicking through, like, which, which is what a lot of people sort of suggest, right? So here what we did is we simply looked at their performance on the real effort task and see whether, they, uh, uh, whether the, 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 the inter, the interclass correlations within those 10 rounds were high. In other words, if someone did well on the first RET, did they do well on the 10th, right? So this was sort of a measure of stability, right? And basically, it, you know, basically people behave pretty stably across the 10 rounds, no matter what the mode was. So, so that clearly was not, didn't seem to be contributing to the problem. Um, so we sort of pushed on this because we wanted to sort of see what was going on. And we, um, uh, we then explored this notion, well, maybe there's an age issue, right? In other words, maybe uh, the, uh, if, because if you look, the, the, the MTurk and the CES online are older, right? And they clearly report higher levels of their income, right? And the, the, the UK, subject, the, uh, the Oxford subject pool clearly is younger, and they report, they're, less like, they're much more likely to lie, right? And so we explored this, we introduced some controls, and it doesn't seem to be age, right? So if you control for age I, in, 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 within modes, right, that doesn't seem to be driving the difference, right? Um, uh, so we, we sort of rejected age as being this, pro this, this other socioeconomic characteristic that might have been explaining the difference between the modes. Um, but we still were sort of concerned about this mTurk effect. So we then, as, as a possible explanation for measurement error, so then what we did, so, so this was thanks to Roberto actually. So then what we did is said, oh, say, okay, oh, well, let's, we were at the time when I was sort of uh, working on this paper, uh, we were doing these uh, online experiments in um, India with MTurk and with our CES online subject pool in India. And I thought, well, maybe we can sort of explore this notion of inattention more explicitly in, 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 with some, some experimental work, with some additional experimental work, right? And so what we did is, we did two things. I'll just summarize this. Uh, we did, one thing we sort of explored was, well, um, what happens if we explicitly introduce measurement error um, into the experiment and compare people who, have ex who, have, who, who, are, who are subjected to the same experiment, right, decision-making experiment, except uh, 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 with additional explicitly added measurement error, right? And our, our sort of conjecture here was, well, it, if, for the MTurk respondents, it shouldn't matter because they're already inattentive and there's already lots of measurement error in their decision making. And effect, so that's the top part of this table. And effectively, that's true, right? So in this experiment that I won't go into detail on, we, 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 we got we, we, we didn't get a significant effect for the MTurks, but we did get a significant effect for the CES online subject pool, right? And uh, it turns out that uh, introducing measurement error for the CES online subject pool did affect the, uh, the decisions, right? But it had little effect on the MTurk uh, 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 respondents. And that was some initial evidence to us that the MTurk uh, respondents, uh, uh, unlike the CES Online respondents, were not paying much attention. So then we decided, okay, let's, let's, let's explore this further. Um, 
And we then sort of explored the effect of incentives. What happens if we have these MTurk respondents play, uh, make the same kinds of decisions, except in this one, explicitly incentivize their decisions so that they understand that if they click through or are inattentive, then they'll be foregoing some uh, income. And here we get exactly the effect we expected, right? Once we introduced incentives and made it clear to the MTurk respondents that if they didn't pay attention, they would be foregoing income, we got a significant effect, right? So these various levels of exploration led us to sort of conclude that uh, it, it seems plausible that these effects we're seeing here are the result of sort of inattention on the part of the MTurk uh, uh, participants in the, in, in the ex experiment. The takeaway from this, though, is simply uh, if you're doing experiments with subjects, think about doing them in multiple modes, different modes, right? Think about analyzing the data with machine learning because here, here, here we're, uh, we're not imposing any kind of structure on the conditional average treatment effects. We're basically saying, just let's sort of, let's see which are significant, right? And then let's look at, uh, visually look at the conditional average treatment effects and then see whether it's plausible that the, re the result is robust to different modes, right? And then once you find some patterns in the data that suggest that there may be mode effects, then spend some time trying to figure out, right, uh, what is it that might be plausibly contributing to the measurement error? Yes. Um, this is really cool, Ray, but I'm, I'm a bit confused what the aim is exactly. Is it to, um, so that we are certain that a given study, the effect size of a certain study is true in some sort of sense? And so you're doing these to, you then do multiple replications across different modes to then see if that initial one was correct. Is, is that the... That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the ultimate aim. So the ultimate is, aim basically in an, in an ideal world, right, is that, uh, you know, the, the conditional average treatment effects in these different modes that you estimate, right, are all sort of very close to this blue line, right? Uh, in a, regardless of what the mode is, right? Or if they aren't, that there's no systematic pattern here, right, uh, from one mode to the next, right? But does this, this relies on you getting some sort of initial effect size from a single study? Well, this is the or, problem. I mean, I mean, this is the episode, right? This is the sort of broader issue, right? right. You do an experiment, okay, and you get, and, you know, and it gets published in the American Economics Review, and it's only based on MTurk subjects, which we see a lot of, right? Then the question is, okay, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, I'll stop there, right? <laughs> uh, why not, right? I've got a significant conditional, I've got a significant uh, treatment effect. Uh, my point is, you shouldn't stop there, right? You should at least sort of explore the robustness of this treatment effect in these different, very different modes. So I, I fully agree that they, people should be exploring and you know, not presenting the results in one study, but would it not be better from the get-go just to, the, the problem with some of this is that people are finding significance in studies that given a certain effect size are underpowered, for example or they're doing certain activities like harking, so they're not registering the hypotheses and therefore finding these significant results and the effect size is actually not interesting whatsoever. I, I, so I know it's a slightly distinct issue, but if we did that more instead of replicating ad infinitum, that might be actually a better strategy. In, in I, think, I, I think it's a very good strategy. I think it's a, a, a necessary strategy, right? Pre-registration, uh, you know, uh, holding your hands so there's no p-hacking, um, uh, having properly powered uh, experiments. All of this is very important, right? But the bottom line is you could have a pre-registered study that's highly powered on MTurk that looks like this. <laughs> That's my only point. I mean, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't do all these things. I think they're very important. 
but I'm simply saying you can do all of them and still be here. Right. So thank you. So I think it's fascinating to, to use the, the machine learning approach, but then given your research aim, I'm, I'm just wondering, we had this recurring discussion within the Summer Institute about uh, the potential for uh, shift changes at Mechanical Turk. So this will be within mode measurement error in, in your framework. So when you go on Monday, it's a completely different sample when you go on Wednesday. And so therefore, it, but it's very difficult to disentangle whether uh, between mode measurement error is in fact within mode, it, it, it's dependent on the within mode measurement error. See what I mean? Like, like yes. fluctuations, seasonality, etc. So I wonder how you, obviously the, 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 the logical thing to do would to do multiple within modes as well and look at the measurement error. But what is your intuition on that? This kind of feels that this is a pretty important component. Right. So, so, your argue, so your basic argument is that time is a confounding variable here. Yes. Yes, it is true that you did these other sort of modes, but you did them a month later. <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, I could escape that problem here because uh, uh, short of anticipating the replication strategy, the, anticipating the micro-replication strategy, and then doing it simultaneously. Yes, you're right. I mean, this is, it's always the possibility that um, now, some things are m more likely to be confounded than others. I don't, like this study is interested in cheating and lying. It's not clear to me that this particular um, uh, outcome would be susceptible to this. But you're right. If it were political, right, and you were talking about, I don't know, uh, some sort of uh, framing experiment where you're interested in whether people respond to some, you know, uh, 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 framing uh, treatment, right, in a, in a political campaign, then then this would not be appropriate, right? Okay, then, yeah. What's it? There's a fundamental difference between a Nuffield 50,000 and the mechanical third, which is a marketplace, right? So. Uh, so there's a demand supply. If, if you see what I mean, so, so I uh, yes. So what is the difference? Why? Well, I would say that that the marketplace has a lot more potential for within mode temporal variation, which is not necessarily like in the classical treatment sense that it's before or after an election, but just two a.m., four a.m., six a.m., eight a.m. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Because uh, right, a time of day. Um, Why, so I'm just trying to think of why that would be. Um, so let's say a lot of uh, people think Pakistan as a, as a way to for, for, this, for their basically their income. So therefore, you would have a completely different subsample of the complete population. Oh, I, I don't doubt that. I mean, I mean, I, I don't, I don't exactly know what 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 is making what is generating this. Nor do I know exactly why M Turkers are less attentive, possibly, than Sess Online. I mean, well, I do have a, I do have a, and that, that's what motivated this idea here. So the Sess Online subject pool is non-deception, is highly paid, uh, highly uh, 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 compensated. There's, uh, we have very strict ethical rules, right? Um, it's very infrequent, right? Someone, I mean, it's so unlike uh, MTurk, where they're professional uh, online crowdsource workers, they're not being paid much, right? They may be in some click farm in Venezuela, but we don't know, right? They could be bots, right? So all of that is an issue, right? Just to further respond to Mark, there's also, if you, if you use the platform, there is ways you can screen for that so you can make sure that for example you get from pakistan let's say people from every uh, part of the, every hour so like you have a quota for every hour and then you stop collecting and you can also enhance that with uh, instruments like the ones ray and i use like qualtrics and stuff where you put extra um like for example uh, quotas in so like uh, people click through and then we say no thanks like we already have people like you and then the quota opens back up so like it, it's a question of using the mturk is just a way to reach people you want, and then you just have to be very, very careful about the constraints you put on the people you want, so that only them they click through. That's the only thing. Yeah. Just one, I would like to think of it as a population sample influx 
us or not, uh, if you see what I mean. Because the mechanical curve, the boundaries are undefined. Uh, whereas for all the other modes, it seems they are. But I'm not sure because I don't know all the modes. But especially for the Noctis one, the boundary is, we know the 50,000, right? And yes. I, yeah, I'm not sure I would call it. In, that's interesting. I mean, yes. Yes, I mean, I, I, I'm not quite sure what you mean by influx, to be honest. It's like, it's like every, every so, so, up to your Noctis study, you always know who your list of participants, so like you know the, the broader 50,000, right? So uh, the, 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 the Nuffield participants aren't unlike MTurk in one respect. So there's like India, there's like 15 or 20,000, right? They don't all participate in the experiment. We send out an invitation. We don't, you know, the, the, some percentage of them will be interested and sign up. I'm not sure how that's dramatically different. I mean, I think the subject pools are different, but I don't know how, in terms of flux, how that's dramatically different than publishing a hit and waiting for some mTOR person to sort of say, oh, you know, I'll respond. So I'd say that the most important confounder potential would be competition on the marketplace, right? So for example, if... Uh, yes, you're right. We're not competing with anybody else. And you're right. An mTOR uh, crowd worker basically is looking at all of the possible hits and making a decision. You're right. That, that is quite different. So I was wondering, um, you found, and I think maybe you mentioned previous studies found it as well, that attention is very important in maybe explaining a difference between like experiments and online experiments. And do you maybe know of any study that have tried short attention tasks during an, an, another experiment to sort of control for that, like to have a weight? In I I'm sure people have. So there's, there's a woman who in the US who has looked at this pretty carefully, uh, Sunshine uh, Hilligus at Duke, and she has this whole sort of uh, research agenda explicitly looking at MTurk, Lucid uh, respondents, and um, uh, not just them, also, also looking at uh, uh, people who just answer SSI or respondee and explicitly looking at um, um, uh, you know, this whole phenomena of inattention, click-throughs. And she has a really interesting paper where uh, she tries to explore the relationship between that behavior right, and uh, subject characteristics, right? And, you know, some people, for example, say, oh, well, you know, we'll just get rid of these people, right? Let's, but that's, I mean, her argument is that's not what you want to do, right? Because these are sort of an interesting population, right? So, so she has a very clever sort of uh, uh, analysis, which is worth looking at. Um, <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks very much. I'm not an experiment person. I'm a demographer. Uh -huh. And I keep thinking whether this mode effect that you have, or what you call a mode effect, whether this might actually be some sort of a, you know, a difference in the composition of the people in the different modes. And whether there would be a way, or maybe this is not something you do, but whether there would be a way to think for example, if you think that there might be educational differences in the way people respond in such an exercise, then you could potentially have a highly educated pool of people for each four modes and a low educated for each mode. Or what you could maybe also do, I don't know if this is something that you do, but you could take your Oxford people and take the same people and make them play the game in the lab and make them play the game online and see if they, the same people, if they do something different. Because to me, that would be a mode effect. So when, when I'm in the That's lab, I'll be nice. And when I'm at home and nobody sees what <laughs> I'm doing, then maybe I won't declare my income at the same rate. That's a very good point. So there is a paper out there by uh, a woman from UCLA, Lynn Vavrick, where she actually randomly assigns people 
I mean, she recruits people and then she randomly assigns them to mode. She randomly assigns them to uh, online, randomly assigns them to, I think, in person. And she compares. It's a recent paper. So, uh, so she does explicitly this. Um, uh, and, and her result, there are some areas in which there are differences, clearly. Um, but I forget. The, but that is the, op, that is the optimal design. Uh, if we could have done it, we, it would have been good to randomly, to randomly select the UK to the, 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 the CES subjects and then randomly assign them. Because obviously, they're not randomly assigned. They get to select whether they want to do it in the lab. or in, And so there may be selection there. Um, the other thing about this, now I'm just thinking about the Sunshine's papers. The other thing she looks at, which is really cool, um, is um, there's this big phenomena in online where people give ridiculous responses. And this is becoming a big problem. And so people, who, particularly younger people who are sort of in a social media sort of, you know, they, they, they've been on social media all their lives, right? They tend to sort of respond to these, they just give, uh, you know, absurd responses. And this is a big problem in these, these experiments, right? Because, you know, you, you know, you see these people that are sort of really ex giving extreme responses. And the question is, well, <laughs> is this true or false, right? How do you deal with it, right? And again, she looks at the, ex the, the people often try just to drop them out, right? But that might not be the optimal strategy. So I agree, it's a very... I'm, I don't think I've solved this problem. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but the idea is to give you a flavor of uh, how to think about uh, both on the design side, think of multiple modes, and then on the analytics side, think about the machine learning to sort of tease out the, um, uh, the, the mode effects uh, and establish the robustness of your treatment effects. I think that that's the... the, the uh, my, my punchline on that. My punchline on the other, okay, so I have uh, 17 minutes. Um, <laughs> so I'll go over this very quickly. So a second thing, uh, the second project that we've been involved in in CES, and this is sort of an extension of something that uh, I was working on with, uh, with Roberto, is um, use, using uh, 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 sort of the virtual environment and post stratification methods to estimate average treatment effects. Um, and this is a project that is uh, uh, quite new um, that I'm working on with a, post, with a, a, a PhD student at King's College, uh, uh, Felipe. Uh, and here, um, I'll just highlight some of the, what I think are the more interesting parts of the project. Uh, we're interested in, so there's this big debate in political science, but probably only in political science, um, interested in whether, um, and there's sort of a, a, a puzzle. Uh, uh, so when you think about democracies, you think about people should be informed. Uh, about their political representatives, and um, uh, there's been all of this literature out there, these experiments that have been done in which people have been given information about their politicians or their, the incumbent politicians, about the fact that they're corrupt or that they're uh, hopeless uh, and that they're doing bad things. And um, most of these experiments have suggested that it doesn't matter. You can tell voters that their, you know, incumbent politician is a crook, uh, is hopeless, is stealing money from you, and it doesn't affect their, their decision in terms of re-election. They don't, it doesn't affect their vote choice, right? Um, and of course, you know, political scientists are quite sort of disturbed by this, right? This has got them agitated. And uh, so this is an experiment in that vein. Um, although we think we're doing it more rigorously uh, than most people have done it. So what we've done is, so we have this lab in Chile, and we've set up, uh, uh, we have a, a collaboration agreement with the ministry in Chile that is responsible for auditing municipal politicians. So they audit the politicians, and we've convinced them 
to cooperate with us and to, to allow uh, and, and to uh, randomly assign these audits to different municipalities in um, Chile. And so that's, a, that's an opportunity for us to explore whether uh, the results of these audits affect uh, voter decisions. Um, and there's, uh, so we're just starting this and the, the election's in 2020. So this is a unique opportunity for us to uh, randomly assign audits to the mun municipalities, uh, inform the voters about the results of these audits and see whether it affects their vote decision. So that's the sort of flavor of this. Um, and so this is Chile. There are 345 municipalities in Chile. It's, it's a weird country, like it's sort of like a, I don't know, like a worm or something. And then it's, uh, uh, the, everything is sort of distributed along here. And uh, the idea is that we're going to uh, randomly assign audits to um, a 40 of these, um, no, to 60 of these municipalities. Um, so the basic design that we think is vaguely interesting is that we're going to do a pretreatment survey, um, and we're going to uh, the sample is going to be 60 municipalities and 250 sort of small counties. I call them zip codes, but uh, so these zip code things are within the 60 municipalities, and we're going to uh, basically uh, target 6,500 people in the pre-treatment survey. And we're going to use Facebook Ad Manager to basically identify uh, the, uh, to, to, to organize the, um, uh, the pre-treatment survey. So we're going to, we're going to um, uh, identify, so we're gonna, the, the basic, we have 250 of these sort of zip code things. And we're going to identify people in these 250 zip code things using Facebook Ad Manager, right? So that's, uh, uh, and then we're going to recruit them into the, into the experiment. And then we're going to conduct a, um, a pretreatment survey, which will give us covariates and will allow us to get, get a sense of what their vote preference is for the municipal governor, right? And so the treatments then are going to be random audits of 30 of these municipalities that the ministry will do. Um, and 30 of the uh, municipalities will be in the audit treatment, and then 30 will be in the control treatment. Um, and then uh, the information treatment is, uh, this is the thing we're going to be doing. We're going to, uh, uh, we're going to uh, for, for some of these 250 zip code things, we're going to have an information treatment. We're going to inform everybody, hopefully, in that zip code of the re result of the um, uh, of the uh, audit, right? Um, and of course, there will be people in the control zip codes who will get no information. That's the sort of broad idea. Um, then there will be after after there is this treatment. So there's two levels of treatment. There's an audit will be one level, which is at the municipal level. And then there will be information treatments within the audits, within the, uh, within the audited uh, uh, municipalities. Um, then we'll, there will be a post-treatment survey in which we go back and re-interview those 6,500 people in principle. <laughs> and then we'll get their vote preferences in the post-treatment period. Um, and then um, uh, the final part of this is to think about post-stratification. How do we estimate those? So we'll be able to estimate treatment effects for you know, these 250 villas, villas or these um, municipalities. But then the question is, how do we uh, post-stratify those estimated average treatment effects to the entire population? Because we want to know, you know, the politicians, and we do, we want to know what the uh, what the 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 treatment effect is for the entire country, right? Potential treatment effect, because that's what they're interested in, right? Does it does it make sense? Uh, I mean, they're interested in whether these audits have any effect for the nation, right? And that's where the post stratification comes in, which which is quite important. And this is the part that most people don't do, 
right? This is the part that most experimentalists don't think about. They, they, they estimate a treatment effect, and that's it, right? Um, and we're sort of hoping or thinking that this might partially contribute to the fact that people don't get really good, good estimates of what, what the information treatment effects look like. Um, Okay, so the Facebook, this is all, so we're going to use Ad Manager, which we've used before in Chile, which, which will allow us to, so basically identify the particular, one of these, which of the 250 sort of count of zip codes we want to target for recruitment into the um, study. So we'll, we'll do this for 250 zip codes, right, within those, within those 60 municipalities. And we'll recruit people using Facebook ads, right? Which we've done before, right? So we'll recruit them into the into the into the study. And this is a high for us. This has been a very effective way of getting people to participate in these virtual experiments. It's a bit expensive because <laughs> you obviously have to pay Facebook, <laughs> but it's pretty uh, uh, it, it's it's pretty useful, and it allows us to target particular treated and untreated segments of the experiment. Um, so we'll do that. Uh, so it'll allow us to target subjects in specific counties or zip codes. Um, we will use banner ads to get people to come into the, uh, to come into the uh, 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 experiment. And ideally, we'll do this with 6,500 people. Um, that's just the dashboards. I don't think you need to see that. Uh, this, uh, so uh, the, just, just to be clear, the treatments will be, we'll actually have two levels of treatments. One will be uh, people will see the results of an audit, in a two by, actually two by two factorial design. Though there's two information treatments. One is the audit result, right? And the other is what we call a report card, which is just a report on the performance of that municipal mayor. And so some people will see just an audit. Some people will see just a report. Some people will see uh, a report and an audit. And then there's a control condition where they where where they get where there's no audits and no information. Just, um, and so this is this roughly summarizes the. So there's a, you can. This is the way we not worth getting into really, but. Uh, the, the, so there will be treatments uh, at the, these are the treatments that are administered by the ministry, right, at the, at the municipal level, which is an audit or a no audit. And then there will be information treatments that are administered at the uh, zip code level, right? So within all of these um, uh, audit, no audit treatments administered by the uh, ministry, there will be uh, information treatments at the sort of zip code level, right? That reflect the sort of either the report or audit or report and audit or control. Um, is that sort of clear? Um, so the information treatments, so this is sort of, this is the kind of information treatment you would, they would see, right? You know, they're, you know, this municipal mayor uh, is, you know, risked uh, six years in prison for uh, uh, defrauding. Uh... <laughs> that's okay. So th that's the problem with the design, to be honest. Um, so there are multiple levels to this experiment, but you're right. I mean, we are targeting a particular zip code using Facebook ads. So only people in that zip code are going to sort of, that are going to uh, be targeted with the information. But yes, there's, I mean, we cannot assume that there won't be contamination or, yes. I mean, that's, I mean, I, we've, to be honest, we've not figured that out entirely or how we'll measure it. I mean, so even if there is some, you know, spread, uh, the, the important issue is whether we can measure it. If we can measure it, then, then that's fine. But the possibility is that there will be this stuff going on, and we won't be able to measure it. So I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, at this point, how we're going to tackle that problem. You're right. <laughs> and then at the same time, how, I mean, there's a strong confounder, which is the media, right? So you could have media outlets going for one particular candidate. Yes. 
Yeah, so um so how would you, so one strong confounder that I can think of is media, right? So if you have an information campaign that which is saying in a particular villa uh this candidate is good or bad or whatever, but then you have media sort of being biased in any way towards one particular candidate, one particular party and so on and so forth, it's sort of like a strong confounder. It could actually influence that person's vote over the information campaign or vice versa. I'm not, not not on the topic, but I could definitely see it as a second founder, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so you you're right. <laughs> um, uh, so so I get the problem that you're identifying is say, okay, so we have one zip code where that's in our information treatment and another zip code that's not in our information treatment. And both of these zip codes is getting, or both is getting a media representation. Well, that I don't think is too much of a problem because, I mean, it won't affect our ability to distinguish the inf our information treatment to the treated, now, in the worst case scenario, it'll totally wash out any treatment effect, right? Which could happen. In, in which case, yes. But it, it it won't it won't bias our estimate of the treatment effect because both of these both of these uh, units will have received, in principle, the same media information. But you're right; it could totally wash out the treatment effect. It's possible. Our assumption is that the media is not going to be. Um, uh, uh, focused on specific municipalities, but we may be wrong. So, so one way to maybe circumvent this is to simply ask in the questionnaire, sort of like uh, exposure to media, how long right. you read newspapers, how you go on Facebook, right. exposure to other types of information, and you could sort of control. We that. could try to yes, yes, and we could do that in the we could do that both in the pre and the post treatment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's a possible. That's a, that's a possibility. Um, now, the, I won't even tell you the other part of the experimental design, which is even more sort of, I'm, so the other thing, so, the, so here we're, I'm just talking about the uh, voters, right? Uh, the other part of the experiment, which I'm not going to talk about today, but which I'll tell you, which is even more sort of uh, uh, problematic, but maybe more interesting, is that we want to, so the, the problem with a lot of these political science studies is they look at this. They look at the, 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 the treatment effect on the voter, right? Which is what we're doing here, which is what I'm talking about here. But the other thing we want to do is we want to treat these municipalities with information and see whether it affects the politician, Right, because that's the more. And so, what happens if we do an information treatment and broadcast the result of a audit to the electorate? Right. The 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 interesting th one of the most interesting thing for us is whether that affects the politicians' behavior. Do they start engaging in more clientelistic um, uh, stuff? And and with this audit agency, we are able to monitor their daily expenditures and where they're going, right? So we'll be able to determine whether, you know, our information treatment, in addition to the audit result, right, uh, affects the specific spending priorities of the uh, municipal mayor. So that's the sort of interesting thing is. So we'll look at their spending, but we're also... This is the thing uh, that, that Roberto inspired me on. We'll also look at their Facebook pages because we've just we've noticed that all of these municipal mayors have active Facebook pages. So the question is, when they're treated either with the audit, the random audit, and result, and with our info, and the municipalities treated with our information treatment, whether that has an effect on the content of their um, Facebook stuff, right? But also whether it has effect on digital trace. So in other words, now this is even more fa hazy, whether we can sort of look at the people, how do people respond to like a negative um, uh, audit, the voters? Do they also go to the Facebook page of the politician 
And who is going to the, fa the, the, fa the, the Facebook page of the politician, right? Because we'll be in, in principle, we'll be monitoring their Facebook pages and we'll see who goes to the Facebook page. And then we'll be able to say something about the people who, the voters who are responding to the, uh, both the shock and to the content of the politician's Facebook page. That's sort of the, that's the sort of design issues. And then I have one, one minute, I'll just wrap up. Okay, we'll do the average treatment effects. That's all. Um, so we'll also, the idea is we'll do post gratification, right? Which Roberto's already talked to you about. But you can sort of think we'll, we'll have some very, not too broad, we'll have about 36 cells in our um, uh, post gratification frame, right? Two gender, two education, three income, three age. And then these are the uh, number of cells, right, generated by each of these categories, right? And then we'll have about 33 individuals from the 6,500, right, in each of these, in the audit information cell uh, breakdown and in the audit no information cell breakdown. So these are the cells to which we, for, on which we will be estimating the post stratification model, right? And since you know all this already, we'll be doing, we'll be estimating a pretreatment um, vote choice model, right? Uh, using uh, some sort of machine probability estimator, right? Like random forest, right? So we'll estimate pre-treatment uh, pre vote, vote preference. And then we'll be estimating post-treatment vote preference. In principle, we can post-stratify that to uh, the um, to all of the. Oops, I'm not seeing it. No. Do I have the numbers? No, I don't. Um, we'll be able to post-stratify those results to all of the cells, either in the nation or within a particular municipality, right? And then since we've post-stratified the pretreatment vote choice uh, to all of those cells, and since we post-stratified the post-treatment vote preference to all of those cells, then we can simply by um, subtracting those two quantities get a sense of what the average treatment effect is for this very detailed breakdown of individuals within the nation. So that's the sort of rough um, uh, strategy. So that's. I'm going to get a mic, sorry. Sorry, I mean, this is a very general question in relation to post stratification in the context of experiments. And I'm wondering if, um, so in the, I understand the rationale here to some extent is to go from internal validity to external validity. But if we think about what you were talking about, modes earlier, right, and perhaps this is less relevant specifically for this example, but how do we think about the fact of post stratifying when there also might be these mode effects that might be operating? So, you know, can we, how, so that I find a bit hard to get around and think about um, because in the specific context of experiments, that could be also a. So this is probably the criticism that we will, I mean, have to deal with. Because of course, someone, I mean, I think people will come to us and say, okay, well, you know, I mean, the point of departure here is to recruit subjects, right, using Facebook, right? And that's a mode, right? And uh, the question is, I mean, uh, I know now from having done this in Chile that, for example, right, it's very difficult to get certain segments of the population to participate, right? Um, that's very specific to Facebook, right? Um, uh, we know now that it's hard to get younger people. Younger people don't have Facebook accounts. I mean, they're on other social media, right? So they'll be, you know, uh, and, and it's hard to recoup that segment, right, into the study. So you're right. But then uh, that is a limitation. I mean, and, and doing a multi-mode here would be optimal, but then it would be... Well, I mean, it's, it's, it, you're right. I mean, I, I could do a multi-mode here. I mean, there's no reason why I couldn't, for example, try to recruit people, uh, explore the recruitment on different social media. Um, and I could probably, 
and this assuming the, the budget, uh, I could explore sort of non-social media recruitment into the study, which would be optimal because clearly there are, um, uh, the, you know, that the, the, uh, that would be now. The one saving grace here is that, so I think mode matters quite a bit when people are um, uh, in, uh, uh, for example, in, in the cheating experiment, where people are um, interacting with each other, making sensitive decisions, um, like lying and cheating, right? So I think there are some modes in which people are much more comfortable doing that and other modes in which they're less comfortable. So I, I do think that mode matters here. In this case, um, uh, we're asking a pretty simple uh, thing, right? Basically vote preference. Um, and so I would expect mode to be somewhat less important. I mean, uh, uh, just to just to add on that, it's also the idea that as me and Ray have explored with digital trace, you observe people. You don't necessarily have to ask. Uh, and so the idea is that um, even though there might be some mode effects, we're not. You don't have the same problem as you have with the M Turks, where they are like they 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 have an incentive to look for the treatment uh, within your questionnaire or whatever. Here, people are just behaving as they would naturally uh, on a politician's page. And we can see on the politician's page whether they leave a positive or negative review. In that sense, it's not that dissimilar to the, uh, given also the potential N on Facebook compared to like a lab experiment or, or an MTurk, uh, it's not dissimilar to the um, uh, Xbox study because it's not completely absurd that we would get hundreds of thousands of uh, individuals commenting amongst these uh, different munip municipal places. So I think, yes, like as always, there is these selection of tax issues, but I think less important here than on MTurk for sure and all the other types of modes. No, okay. I mean, I would I'll, then I'll just wrap up by 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 uh, elaborating on what Roberto said. I mean, so optimally, it, I mean, and this would be the mode thing. Optimally, it would, and it just it's budget related. I would very much like to have this unobtrusive measure where I'm just observing who is participating on these different web pages, and then uh, and then. And then using those digital, then sort of reverse engineering from that, that digital activity to the individual and then populating the cells in terms of uh, partisan preference and socioeconomic stuff if I could get it. That would be the optimal sort of outcome. I mean, I, and I think, uh, uh, I, I think ideally I would want to complement the simple survey strategy with these digital trace strategies, if it's possible, but that's again budget related. As we, as I learned, it can be expensive uh, trying to sort of uh, collect this digital trace information. <laughs> so, can I not ask this question on the mic? <laughs> Say that again. Uh, <laughs> uh, it shouldn't be controversial. That that would be my position, uh, <laughs> because I have a Russian uh, a Russian uh, co-author who has uh, seen what Roberto and I did in the Texas election and said, "Oh, we should really do this in Russia. I can get access to all the Russian version of the Facebook data." Um, so I'm wondering, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how I would be sort of perceived as sort of uh, interfering with Russian election. You're right. I, I'm sympathetic to your point. <clears throat> uh, just a comment uh, on the, the problem with the spillovers between, between the treated and non-treated observations. I mean, it might also be interesting, I don't know if you get some kind of like connectivity between the users from Facebook. Oh yeah, uh, but but I mean, otherwise you could also lose like like, like uh, the spatial distance and see whether I mean maybe the treatment effect declines with distance, which would be quite. That would be that would be yes that that might be because this is what we're thinking about. How can you sort of uh, control right? And that would be an optimal uh, that would be an optimal control. 
plus we do have the geolocation, right? So um, we will we will be able to sort of use that. Okay, so last yeah, question. Just a, a final question. So um, just to go back to the initial part of the presentation about reproducibility of these types of studies, um, like what exactly would your recommendation be? Obviously, I see that you should, as a researcher, do uh, reproduction, uh, reproduce, try to reproduce your results in different uh, modes. Uh, but how should uh, journals be checking reproduce? Oh, oh, so that's a very, that's, so journals, in my opinion, are checking for the wrong thing. Yeah, exactly. Right? right. No, they, 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 there's, I mean, it's, I mean, I just met with a bunch of journal editors. It's ridiculous. So, yes, so journals, the only thing they do is they want a replication file, right? And then they, they, they're going to run, the, and then they sort of basically make sure that you can replicate table six, right? Well, that, in my opinion, is useless, right? The problem isn't replication so much as data generation, right? Because we don't know, right? I mean, in Cre that was my sort of earlier point. I mean, you know, we don't know uh, how these, increasingly we no longer know how these d data are generated, right? Like when I started many, you know, decades ago, right, data generation was very expensive, uh, very, you know, uh, well-respected firms were the ones that did the data generation. And uh, everybody knew that uh, this was, you know, data generated by, uh, you know, Michigan or um, uh, Gallup, right? Uh, they knew that there were all these controls in term, in, in associated with the data generation. Now that doesn't exist, right? It's totally, nobody knows, you know, you, you see lots of stuff published in journals now by people who said, uh, you know, I got a thousand MTurkers to do this task. Mm, okay, <laughs> I mean, there's there's absolutely no um, control over the data generation, and, and and that is that I think is the problem we're going to have to sort of deal with. Yeah. But I'm just saying that you're basically making a or, 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 well, it shows basically that the difference between modes that any reproduction study done in a different mode, showing a different result than the initial result, is in itself. Uh, up to some degree to be expected, right? So a reproduction yeah. study should, per definition, be in the same mode. So, so what was your so last? Any reproduction studies should, per definition, be at least in the same mode. Because otherwise, no. I think. I mean, I think this table that I, 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 I think the the results of that Bard analysis, right? I think that's what you should report, right? Oh yeah, I, no, of course, of course. But, but I mean, I, but I, but I think for me that would be much more reassuring. Okay, you do have a there is a there is a there is a statistically significant uh, treatment effect that blue line, right? And uh, yes, there's some variation across mode, but yeah. it's it's not that you know it doesn't detract. You're simply informing the readers that you know there clearly there's some heterogeneity here. I'm being honest about it, right? I'm, I'm I'm not quite sure why it's happening, right? But that's transparent. That's what you should do, in my opinion. Yeah, but I'm just saying if there is a mechanical Turk study and I want to do a reprodu reproduction of it, and then I choose just a single mode. So in that sense, I would prefer to do multi modes, but I'm going to be uh, a single mode reproduction. Researcher, yeah. Then I should at least take the same mode, right? If yes, I, as yeah. a point of departure. Exactly. That's a good okay. thing. To, okay, that that was yeah, your yeah. point. Yes, I mean, and then if you can't if you can't replicate it within the same mode, then clearly that's a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Yep. All right. Thank you very much.